Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, you guys can be seated. Lord, we just thank you this morning for your goodness to us. We thank you your name. It says above every other name, any other struggle we're, any struggle we're facing, any illness, any sickness, any financial issues, your name is above that. And we recognize that you have all power in heaven and earth. One touch of your favor can change everything in an instant. So we just believe this morning in faith. Lord, I pray for anyone this morning, whatever they're going through, Lord, that they would just look to you as the answer because it's your name that is above all other names. It's above cancer. It's above all these medical diagnoses that we've been getting. It's above the financial struggles. It's above inflation. You can provide for us even in the midst of what seems like lacks. We thank you for that. In your name, amen. Hey, well, good morning and welcome to Crossroads. I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here, and I have been honored to serve for the past five years under our pastors, uh, Marcus and Natalie Avalos. So if you're, if you're new here, welcome. And uh, we're continuing a series today called Keep It Light. It's based on a book I'm working on right now. It'll be out April 15th of 2020, whatever next year is, four Losing track of years here. It'll be out April 2024, and uh, I'm submitting it to the publisher August 30th. So uh, this is our test run of the material. And uh, we, the basic con- premise is this. Jesus says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. A yoke is something that you would put over two oxen, and they would carry a burden together. They'd carry a, a plow. But, you know, if one oxen got ahead of the other, they'd carry a little bit more weight than they were supposed to. If they got behind the other, they'd carry a little more weight than they are supposed to. So our, our job as Christians, when we link up with Jesus is to walk in lockstep with him and let him share the burden that we're carrying. And make no mistake, we're all called to carry a burden. There's a responsibility we all have in life. There's something you've got to carry. And some of us look at other people's responsibility and we're like, how come they've got an easier life than us? That is a very dangerous thing to do, to go comparing your life to someone else. Uh, In fact, it it says in the Bible, it says that when you compare yourselves to other people, it says you're not wise. Because we don't know the weight that everyone's carrying. You know, you see somebody, and especially if you're looking at them on social media, you're only seeing a snapshot of their life. So we've got a weight to carry, and we've got to stay focused on the burden we're called to carry. But I'll tell you this, if the burden of life seems too heavy to carry, there's a good chance you're carrying something that God never intended for you to carry, and he wants to carry that with you. So we've been talking about how to keep it light in life, and we talked about last week the importance of priorities how we've all got certain things we value and certain things need to be more valuable than other things. So I got a little intense last week talking about some stuff that I think is important that we value. And we basically established God says there's two things we should value. Above all else, you need to value him, God, and then people right after that. And then everything else is kind of up for grabs based on the season of life you're in. Sometimes your job needs to take a little more precedence over uh, other things. Sometimes your health needs to take more precedence. But we always remember that relationships are always top, top priority in God's book. First, your relationship with him. And second, your relationship with others. And when those are in order, everything else seems to work itself out. So we're going to talk this week about the fact that a lot of us, I mean, if we're honest... We feel limited and overwhelmed. A few years ago, uh, I had written a book that did not do well. Well, at least in my opinion, it didn't do well right out the gate. I wanted a lot of copies to sell, and I was so frustrated with life, and I was so angry, and I was like, God, I thought this book was going to take off. I thought every, like, I was going to be speaking to millions, and I wasn't, and I was very frustrated. And I, I hired this coach, and he told me this when we met. He said, the only thing holding you back right now is your mindset, and I said, That's absolutely ridiculous. There's a lot of things holding me back. And you know, you've always heard these gurus, it's just all up here in your mind, man. I'm like, no, there's some stuff that's very real and it's not in my mind. Anyone ever related to that? Like, it's a very real problem. We started coaching me and you know, there's a verse that says, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In a very real way, the obstacles you're facing today all start right here in how you're approaching things. So I sat down and I had a come to Jesus meeting with myself. You ever had a come to Jesus meeting with yourself? You're like, hey self, I'm not liking the way things are going. Here's what I wrote down about myself. This was me talking to myself. So I'm going to be kind of vulnerable and share this. Of course, it's going to go in the book, so lots of people will read it. But anyway, here's what I came to the conclusion of. First of all, whenever I don't like something about my life, 
I have to assume that I am the problem, not the world. I assume there is something I don't understand about myself or how people work. Then I start reading, praying, and asking questions. I seek advice. I will shut up and listen to what people say. And I will not make excuses for what my, why my situation is special. It's not. I can't tell myself, they don't understand. My, my situation is unique. No, I assume I don't understand. First slap on the face. Second, I am not special. And no one is going to discover how special I am and launch me to success. The cavalry isn't coming to save me. I have what I need right now to build what I need right now. And that's what I want to talk about today. Because I think, if we were to be honest, every one of us has somewhere in our life where we say this. "Ah, If I just had more, mm, I could live the life I really want. Most of us would say, if I just had more money, I could live the life I really want. And so what happens is we start focusing on money. We go, man, if I can just get a little bit more. We talked last week about how most of us, we don't know really what we want. We just know what we don't want. So you spend your life running from what seems to be what you don't want, but you don't really have a vision for what the future could look like. It's just like, I just know I don't want it to look like that. And that's part of vision is saying, I don't want it to look like that. But if you're driven by what you don't want it to look like, you'll have no defined destination when you get there and say, I've arrived at what I wanted it to look like. Okay? So a lot of us, to be honest, we're saying, I don't know what I want, and I don't know how much is enough. I just know I don't want to be poor. But poor is very subjective. I talked to a guy one time, and he said, I just don't know how anybody can make it on 150000 a year anymore. I said, who... Somebody needs to teach you a budget, brother. Like, I'll show you how to live three lives on 150000 a year. Some of you say, if I just had more friends, I wouldn't be so lonely. But yet, you find yourself lonely even in a crowd of people. And a lot of us, we spend time hanging out with people we don't really like just because it's better than being alone. Right? Some of us, not me, I'm married, but some of us date whoever's available because it's better than being alone, if we're honest. Well, I know they're not the best. In fact, they're probably among the worst, but at least I'm not alone. Man, if I just had more education, I could, I could really do something with my life. But really, it's not, you know, I've met so many people that sit around in perpetual training um, there's a, a famous evangelist, Reinhard Bonnke, and he said, those who forever seek the will of God are overrun by those who do it. If you're sitting around thinking, I just need a little more training, I need somebody to put their stamp of approval on me, you're probably never going to get it done. Right. But we've all got something in our lives where we go, man, if I just had more, and we start focusing on that. And so I want to talk today about the principle of focus. All right, so to set this up, we talked last week about how Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, which is basically saying, like, you can figure out what somebody values based on what they give their time, money, and energy to, right? And if you want to know what somebody values, look at what they do, not what they say or think or feel. Oh, I really care about this issue over here. Do you really? Because the way you act doesn't show that you really do. And the way we act, what we do, reveals more about what we believe than what we say or think. That's why faith apart from works is dead. Like, you got to show you're going to do something based on the faith. But then Jesus says, look, you got to focus on the right things. He says, I know you're worried about what you'll eat, what to drink, what you'll wear, but don't worry about those things because even the pagans run after these things, but your heavenly Father, he knows you need them. God knows you need all that stuff. But he says, Stop focusing on that stuff and instead lift your vision to something higher. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. He's saying this, the kingdom of God is God's order. When you prioritize what God prioritizes, in some miraculous way, he takes care of all the other stuff that you're worried about. It's how we live in harmony with the seen and unseen realities of this life. So he's saying, look, I know you're focused right now on the fact that your money is just not going as far as it used to. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
I know you're focused right now on the fact that your kid is acting like a fool and you're like, I didn't raise him this way. I don't know why he's doing this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things you're worried about will be taken care of. And you go, that seems so ethereal. And honestly, it feels a little ethereal to me. But the more I live this out, the more I'm like, it really is true. When you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, when you prioritize what he prioritizes in the order he prioritizes it, all the things that you're worried about, he takes care of. So the important thing is what are you focused on? Because here's the key point for today. Our focus becomes our reality. What you focus on, what you're looking for, you will find. Simple example of this, you ever had your eye on a certain car? Like, I'm going to get that car. And all of a sudden, you see that car everywhere. Yeah. Everybody's driving that car. Wow, that's confirmation. I need that car. What you're focused on becomes your reality. And here's what happens. For most of us, we're focused on lack. I just don't want to be lonely. I just don't want to be poor. You know what mine is? I just don't want to be not influential. I don't want to not have influence. I want to be able to influence people's lives. And so I get so focused on that. And I've had to learn, you know, this is something I've had to really learn. I've worked with a lot of pastors. And the number one mistake that I think they make is they're more focused on their congregation's spiritual growth than they're on their spiritual growth. And it's hard. Like when you're in this job up here, you're always thinking, oh, that could be an example that I could help people see this. Or when you're reading the Bible, how can I present this in a way that people understand? And what happens to a lot of pastors is they get so focused on their congregation's growth that they bottom out on their growth. They don't keep growing. And you know what? I can only lead you as far as I've gone myself. So this sounds weird, but I'm way more concerned about my spiritual growth than yours. Because if I can keep growing, hopefully I can model what that looks like for you. And one of my biggest fears is to become one of those pastors that says a bunch of stuff that's true, but haven't lived it out. And I see that with influencers online all the time. You see them and they say these inspirational things, but I've met them behind the scenes and I'm like, your life is a mess. Now you're speaking the truth and the truth is the truth. So I listen to the truth, but I ain't going to live it out the way you do because clearly you're not living it out the way it's supposed to because God's order puts you in harmony with the seen and the unseen realities of this world. Well, that's kind of harsh. Well, hey, it is what it is. You know a tree by the fruit it bears. And what you're focused on becomes your reality. But here's the really tricky part. Most of us know more what we don't want than what we do want. But what gets dangerous is Having a goal in mind of what you think you want and going after it so hard that you miss out on what God really wants, which is where this gets really interesting, okay? So we think we know what we want most of the time. Most of the time, it's actually what we don't want. But C.S. Lewis talks about this, and I think it's fascinating. He says this, we are really, at our core, we're half-hearted creatures. We're fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. We're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. It's like, can you think about that? A kid sitting there playing in the mud. Dad's like, hey, I'm taking you to the beach. I don't want to leave, but look at my mud. You don't understand what the beach is. You're like, and, and how many of us, we just don't know what we don't know. You know how many of us don't know what we don't know? All of us. (laughs) We don't know what we don't know, but God does. And that's where he says this. We're far too easily pleased. We think we know what we want. And God's like, hey, listen, I've got exceeding joy for you. If you'll just seek my kingdom instead of what you want. But I know what I need, Lord. I know what I need. And he's like, no, no. You know who knows what you need? I do. I made you. I know exactly what will bring you fulfillment. I know the gifts and talents you have that you don't even know are in you, and I want to pull them out, and I'm going to put you in situations that's going to pull you out, pull it out of you. And unfortunately, sometimes those situations are miserable in the process. But on the other side of it, you go, I didn't even know that was in me. Thank you, Lord, for showing me that. So because we don't know what we don't know, and we don't know what could be, 
The key is this. You seek first the kingdom of God and trust that he's going to take you where you really want to be. And that's where it says, this psalm, it says this. If you'll delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. And you go, sweet, I'm going to get a Maserati. Eh, No, that's that's not what that means. It means he'll give you what you really need and what you really want because God's plan for you is what you would want your plan to be if you knew all the details. And some of you guys can relate to that right now because you're looking around and going, I didn't think it could be this good. And I wouldn't have even had this plan for myself. That's my life right now. I'm looking around, I'm like, how did we get here? I mean, if you look at the financial books, we, we just don't make very much money. But God has opened up all these doors for us and, and it's just amazing things he's blessed us with that I never could have done. If you, looked at, if you look at the books, talk to my tax guy, we don't make, <laughs> we don't make a lot of money, but there's all these things people are like, wow, you must just be rolling it. I'm like, actually, we're not. But God's been super good because my goal above all else, and I'm not doing this to brag because it's all him, is I'm saying, God, I think I know what I want, but you know what I really want, so I'm just going to do whatever you say. Amen. And sometimes he's asked me to do dumb, ridiculous stuff in my mind. I'm like, this is not going to work. <laughs> and it works. And then other times I've done things that I've gone, God, watch this. I'm going to do this for you. Remember last week we talked about sacrificing for God and he doesn't care about certain sacrifice? I'm like, God, watch this, what I'm going to do for you. And then all of a sudden I'm like, God, I sacrificed for you. And he's like, I don't care. It's not what I asked you to do. Just do what I asked you to do. Nothing more, nothing less. That's how we keep it light off on our shoulders. You delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you desires of your heart. So here's, so you say, well, then what are we supposed to do with this? Here's the thing we're supposed to do. There's this verse where God's talking about how the kingdom of God works. And he says this, the kingdom of God is like a guy who's going, a, a master who went on a trip and he left three guys with different amounts of talents or money. One guy, he gave five talents. Another guy, he gave two talents. And another guy, he gave one talent. And talents were money at the time, but this could qualify as talents too. And, and here's the challenging thing is a lot of times we look around at people and we go, how come he got five and I only got two? I don't know. Life ain't fair, okay? Like you try and make everything fair and it's not going to go well. <laughs> Equality of outcome just doesn't exist in this world right. unless you're just being tyrannical and trying to force things on people, but it doesn't happen, okay? That's a whole political argument actually too and a philosophical argument, but the bottom line is it ain't fair. I don't know why the master gave some people five. I wish I had the skill and talent of my brother. He is like five times more talented than me in every way. His books have sold way more copies than mine. He knows really important people. I know you guys, but you know, (laughs) y'all are important. (laughs) I'm just kidding. My brother, everywhere I go and speak, it's hilarious. Everywhere I go and speak, I'm getting mic'd up and somebody's like, mom. You related to Jonathan? I'm like, yeah, that's my little brother, right? (laughs) Everywhere I go, my brother's already been there. So anyway, I don't know why he got five talents and I only got two, but it is what it is, okay? So here's what happens. The guy with five talents, he doubles his money. The guy with two talents doubles his money. The guy with one freaks out and is like, what if I fail? And he buries the talent. So the master comes back. He's like, hey, where's my money? And one guy gives five, gets, takes his five and goes, hey, I doubled your money. And the master's like, well done, Bubba. Number two, the guy that had the, sec, the two, two, he doubled it too. And God's like, well done. The guy with one, the master does not have kind things to say to him. He would receive the one talent, came forward and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seeds. So I was afraid. I was afraid of failing. I was afraid of looking like a fool. Any of us relate to that? And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master said, is again, one of these wonderful Jesus quotes we put on Hallmark cards, right? You wicked and slothful servant. Slothful means lazy. You lazy bum. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have at least put my money in the bank. And at my coming, I should have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten. And then he says some really harsh words. He says, to whom has, even more will be given. And who doesn't have, I'm going to take it away from him. You're like, what in the world? Jesus was like, He was trying to get really serious about the fact that this, you're expected to do something with what he gave you. No matter how small it may be, and no matter how unjust it may seem that other people got more, they're better connected, they were born into a better family, they didn't grow up the way I did, you're required to take what he's given you 
and do something with it. And then the beautiful thing is, he's the one that will bring the increase. And the goal here is to get more so we can give it back to him. Because it's him and it's his anyway. Amen. The goal isn't for us, but in the process of giving it back to him, we get to like glory and fulfillment and purpose in our lives. So there's two things that I think we have to steward well. This is simply the word is stewardship. And stewardship is just this. It's doing the best you can with what you have. And it's not about quantity, doing more, because most of us are already doing too much. It's about doing quality, doing what lasts the longest. And there's two areas I think we all need to steward. First, one is your natural talents and abilities. And second is your treasure, which is your time, your money, and your energy. So I'm going to give you some really practical stuff in the next 10 minutes. I'm telling you, this could change your life. It changed my life. I had a conversation. Uh, well, let's first talk about your talents, okay? So there's a guy named Marcus Buckingham. Like, and he talks about how every one of us are gifted with certain things that bring us energy. And when we do them, time just flies. Like some, it's been called in psychology when you're in, in flow. Like, right, you're just like, man, writing is one of those things for me. I will look down at my keyboard and the screen. Three hours later, I look up. I'm like, where did three hours just go? I just, it just really brings me energy. There's other things that do not bring me energy. One of them is doing numbers. Spreadsheets. Now, there's a guy in the house right here, Mr. Greg back here. This guy is totally gifted and loves doing this stuff, right? And I can't imagine that God would put a love for numbers in somebody, but he did. And thank God he did. Because I hate numbers. And he would look at me and say, I, I, I probably don't, I don't want to do what Joel does, right? But thank God he's really good at that and gifted at that. And, but here's the thing Marcus Buckingham talks about. When you're being a good steward, here's the important thing to understand. You got to play to your strengths. What do we do in school most of the time? Like if you come home with like a C in a certain class, they're like, oh, you need tutoring in that. But if you like got all A's in other classes, they're like, oh, you're fine there. The goal of school is to make you a well-balanced individual. Used to be at least. And so we're trying to make well-balanced individuals, right? But, now, but here's the thing. What do we usually want when we get into the real world? We want somebody who's really, really specialized at what they do. I don't want a well-balanced surgeon. I don't want a surgeon who knows how to grow wine. And like, I don't want a renaissance man. I know, I want a man who knows how to cut me open and take out what needs to go. We want somebody who's really well trained in that area. Okay. So here's the thing. You may be a five in an area and you, if you work really hard, might be able to get that five up to an eight. Right. I will never in all, I mean, I can study accounting. I could do math and all, I could learn all this stuff at best. My math abilities will never go higher than a eight if I'm lucky. Now, there's other areas where I fairly, I'm fairly decent at. I'm getting better and better at writing, right? People used to say when I started writing, you're so good at writing. I'm like, now I look back at my writing, I'm like, oh, my writing was horrible when I started, right? But my goal is to get that eight. There's a really good possibility I could get that eight up to a 10. But if I spend all day long trying to figure out numbers and math, I'm never going to have the energy to put into taking my eight to a 10, and in your life, there's some areas, there's some things you're so good at, you don't even realize you're good at them because you think everybody's good at them, but they're not. You're too close to yourself to see it. I've been told I'm really good at handling conflict. And I'm like, well, conflict is life. I love conflict. And some people out here are like, just the word conflict makes you want to run out this door. And, and I've, just, I've been, this personality God's given me, I'm just... I don't mind conflict. In fact, I think the more conflict, I'm like, sweet, stuff's getting done here. <laughs> like, as soon as the water gets stirred up, I'm like, we're moving forward, okay? <laughs> my wife is not that person. She hates conflict. My daughter, too, man. Whew. Anyway. <laughs> the two of them ganging up on me, it just doesn't go well. They're like, why do you always have to make things so tense around here? I'm like, tension means something's happening, all right? <laughs> you may be gifted in bringing peace to situations, Right? And there are some times that, man, I just, there's some situations, my wife is really good at bringing peace to situations. And there's some situations where I go, if I go in here, I'm going to blow this up. Sweetheart, I need you to take this. And here's the beautiful thing. When I let her do what she's good at, she grows in that area. And when she lets me do what I'm good at, I grow in that area. And there's some times where she's getting bullied over and she calls me and she's like, I need you to take care of this. And I'm like, sweet, bring it. I'm ready. Bah! I like a good fight. A godly good fight. Anyway, 
My point is this, there's some stuff you're so naturally gifted at, you think everybody's gifted at, but they're not, and it's something you need to figure out that you're gifted at, and there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that you're gifted at it. It's not lack of humility. Humility is simply acknowledging reality. And the reality is there's some things you're really good at, and you say, well, I don't know what it is. Well, ask somebody around you, because they know. They're like, man, this is the go-to person for this. When I need somebody to really care for somebody, this is who I call on, right? So my point is this, steward what you're good at, and that takes some, we're going to talk next week about self-awareness, learning kind of who you are and how God wired you and using that. But the second thing I want to talk about is this, using your time, money, and energy to the maximum capacity. And there's a rule God put in place, a principle that he put in place that has changed my life, okay? When I was, my wife and I had that conversation, a dreaded conversation I talked about a few weeks ago where she said, I feel alone. And I'm like, alone? I'm, all, I'm like, I'm at home all the time. She's like, yeah, but you're always working. I started realizing, okay, I need to figure out what it is that, how do I work smarter, not harder? And a lot of us just think if you work harder, you're going to make it, but you're not, right? Some of you just need to work smarter at what you do. And one of the principles that got put in place is this thing called the Pareto Principle. The Pareto Principle, some of you are like, I can't believe he's talking about the Pareto Principle in church. This is a principle God put into place, okay? Pareto Principle says this, 20, 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes, so this guy Pareto, he noticed that 20% of his pea plants were producing 80% of his crop in his garden. And if you're a gardener, you've probably noticed that. Like a small percentage of your plants, they just take off and produce like 80% of the crop. He also noticed in his home country of Italy, 20% of the people owned 80% of the land. And he's like, what is this? And he started seeing it everywhere. That are, there's this principle in place that 20% always produces the 80%. In fact, you look at it in churches, 20% of people tithe and they fund 80% of the operation. Imagine what we could do if 80% tithe. But anyways, that's a side note. 20% leads to 80%. So my question is this, what is it that you do in your life, the 20% that brings 80% results? So I started looking at my life and I realized 80% of my financial income came from speaking and from donations. People give to our ministry monthly so that I can go around and speak stuff like that. You, you guys know when I'm not here, I'm out speaking in different places. And I realized that the 20% that I do that leads to the 80% is always writing and content creation. It's the stuff I write, the blogs I write, the articles I write, the emails, the podcasts I, I'm in, the videos I shoot that, that open doors for me to go speak and write. So I realized, okay, that 20% leads to the 80%. So how do I make sure I'm giving my best to that 20%? And I did the math on this. I said, okay, so what's 20% of an average day? Your average day, you figure you're awake 16 hours. Some of y'all are awake 20, some of y'all are awake less, right? Uh, but that means 3.2 hours of the day would be the 20%. Now here's a fascinating stat. Most people are at their peak mental performance in the first three hours of their day, even without coffee. So here's what I figured out. My first three hours of the day are the sacred time that I focus on my 20% of writing. Some of you as leaders, you get so bogged down when you go into work with emails and people hitting you up and you're not giving your best to what you're really good at. You've got to figure out what your 20% is. So I talk to leaders all the time that as their company grows, they, they built the company doing the work themselves, but they start getting frustrated and overwhelmed because they're capped out. And I say, listen, your 20% no longer is, if you want the business to grow, is no longer got to be spent doing the work here. Your 20% has got to be spent training those who can do the work that you don't have to do. Because there's certain parts of your job you really just absolutely don't have to do. You could train somebody else to do it. But I talk to a lot of pastors. Their church gets to a level and they're like, I'm just so frustrated that we're not growing anymore. And I say, well, here's the, the problem. You're still trying to be the director of Sunday school, preaching every Sunday morning, director of uh, the board, director of uh, like, you know, visiting all the people in the, in the uh, doing all the funerals, visiting everybody in the hospital. And well, that's the role of a pastor. Maybe, but maybe the role of a pastor is to shepherd people into their gift of what they're called to do. So at some point, a church has to get to a point where the pastor can't be the one doing all the work. He has to train and equip those for the work of the ministry that do the other parts of it. And when you see businesses get limited, and I've talked to business leaders and they say, look, I just don't want to be that separated from the customer anymore. I've talked to pastors that say, I just don't want to be that separated from the people anymore. I say, that's fine, but don't get resentful when things don't grow because you can't invest your 20% in what's most important in that. And they, and they say, okay, that's fine, but don't get frustrated because you've capped yourself out. 
At some point, you have to figure out what's the 20% that leads to 80. And if things are growing in your life and God's blessing it, there's a good chance you may need to take yourself a little bit back and start training those around you to walk in their gifting to do other things that they're called to do. My life, doing my taxes, simply not worth it. I'd rather save the several hundred dollars it costs to do my taxes, but it's just not worth the anger, pain, and frustration it causes me and my family. So I hire a guy that's brilliant at taxes and loves numbers. And I go figure out a way to make the money to pay that person because they're really good at it. And it just saves me a lot of suffering and pain. So my, my point is this. You've got to figure out what's... First of all, I think, and this is really fascinating. Okay, check this out. When I use 10% of that first three hours in devotional time, which taps out to about 20 minutes of prayer, reading my Bible and preparing for the day, the day goes way better. Is that that a coincidence that giving a tithe of my 20%? I I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it's when you honor God and you seek first his kingdom. He's like, let me show you what you don't have to do today and what you really do need to focus on today. So my point is this. You've got to get focused about how you're using, first of all, the giftings that you have, and stop doing things that you're not good at. That, that I mean, there's obviously some things you just got to do, all right? Now, let me make a really important caveat here. Because some of you say, I am horrible at parenting. Let me tell you this. If God gave you the responsibility, he's given you everything you need to carry out the responsibility. And sure, get better at it. Read some books. Watch some parenting videos, okay? But if God gave you the responsibility, you need to step in and take responsibility for that because he's given you everything you need right now. It says that by his divine power, he's given you everything to live the way that you're supposed to live. You say, well, I don't feel like I'm enough. Trust me with this. You have what you need, like I told myself a few years ago, to do what you need to do right now. So start small and do the best you can with what you have. And then get really strategic about what are you doing with your time? In your marriage, okay? There's 20% in your marriage. The love languages, the five love languages Gary, Gary Chapman talks about. You know, there's, there, you can spend all day trying to show love to your spouse, but if it's not in their love language, they're never going to feel their love tank is being full. So I've learned with my wife, she's a, a quality time person, unfortunately. <laughs> Means I have to spend a lot of quality time focused looking at her eyes. I can't be looking at the phone. I can't be distracted. I have to be focused. But let me tell you this. When I give her my best, that 20%, it results. I love the results. And the 80% and how it shows up in our marriage. With my daughter, right now in this season, the thing that really connects me with her is every afternoon, right before dinner, she's like, Dad, let's wrestle. And, and she took this jujitsu class and she's gotten very violent lately. So it's, it's very hard on me. But, <laughs> but that's what really fills her love tank right now. So I'm realizing, you know what? If I just give her 20 minutes of wrestling a day, now obviously this isn't a formula to just say, oh, checked off the box, love done. Da, da, da. It's not that way. But it's something that really brings her a sense of connection with me in this season. And she's not always going to want that. There's going to be some days she's like, Dad, don't touch me. But right now she loves it when I throw her against the wall. I mean, she just loves it. <laughs> In your leadership, maybe it's time that you start investing in others instead of having to be in the top guy. Maybe it's time you relinquish a little control instead of feeling like, well, nobody can, if you want a job done right, do it yourself. Maybe the problem, the reason the job isn't being done right is because you're not investing your best in those people. Maybe your best three hours a day needs to be spent training and mentoring and discipling somebody else who can take off and you can triple, quadruple your impact we got to be wise with what God's given us. And here's the beautiful thing. You have what you need right now to do what God's called you to do. Don't doubt it. So build with what you got. Aim. You're like, I don't know where to start. Well, here's the beautiful part about it. You just aim low. What's the smallest step you can take right now to take responsibility for what God's given you and do the best you can with what he's given you? And maybe right now that needs to be, you need to off, so offload some stuff off your plate so that you can give your best to your kids or your wife. The beautiful thing is this. It's God who brings the harvest. And when you do what you can do to the best of your ability, he takes that and says, now watch this. My divine power is going to breathe in your direction. I'm going to launch you to a place you never could have thought you would get on your own. And it starts when you take what you got right now and do the best you can with what you've got. It may not be fair how little you feel like you've got, but trust me with this. Our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly, far above all you could ever ask or think according to his power at work in you. You've got what it takes right now. If you step out, you be courageous. Don't, don't, 
Don't hide in fear what he's given you. Use what he's given you, and God will take you to a level you could not even dream. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you have invested yourself in your, yourself through talents and abilities within us. We've got unique parts of us that, man, nobody else has it, and we need to share that with the world. So I pray you give us wisdom today, Lord, using that Pareto principle to our advantage, leveraging that to, to see how can we be the best stewards of what you've given us. Work with quality, not quantity, not just running around frantically adding stuff to the backpack thinking, if I do this, maybe if I do this, just say, God, what is it you've called me to do? I want to seek your kingdom first, and there is no limit to how far you can take me. I don't even know what my greatest desires are, but you do, and I'm going to trust that in your name. Amen. Hey, uh, let me say, I must, if you're here this morning, you have not accepted Christ into your life. That's the first step in this process. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If we just say this, if you, if you want to give your life to Christ, you already know who you need to, you are. The Lord's already been talking to you. The Spirit's been talking to you. I'm going to say a prayer. And if you say this prayer and mean it in your heart, God's going to take you out of the kingdom of darkness, take you to the kingdom of light. Let's pray. All together, Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you said this prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We'd love to give you some resources in the back. Uh, hey, uh, good amount of money came in last week. We've got a matching gift right now for this building that we're trying to, to get complete out here. They've got the electricity started on it this week. We've got somebody that said up to $20,000, they'll match any gift you give. So if you give $500 towards that project, you'll actually be giving $1,000 towards that project. So it's a great time to give. Uh, it's just going to be expanding. As you've seen this morning, we're running short on space in a lot of ways. So this will allow us to branch out and spread out. So you guys be blessed. You can give on the way out. There's also ways to give over here, online, mail, online, text, live. You guys be blessed. Have a great week. You are dismissed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.